here's an annoying problem. You've built your first VCO, but now you realize you have nothing to control it with. If this is you, no worries. Here's a super simple five-step sequencer I've designed that will make your oscillator sing in no time. Before we dive into the circuit's design though, let's first make sure we understand what a step sequencer actually does. For that, we'll have to separate two types of sequences, CV and gate. CV, if you don't know, stands for control voltage. A control voltage is a voltage that is used to control some parameter on a synthesizer module. An oscillator, for example, usually has multiple control voltage inputs. CV coming from a sequencer is often used to control an oscillator's pitch. The relation here is simple. The higher the control voltage, the higher the pitch. CV sequences are then really just strings of discrete voltage levels. A bit like sheet music for your synthesizer. Consider this example. Here we've got a 5-step CV sequence, where the output voltage increases by 1 on each step. A CV sequencer would then take this sequence of voltages and send them out one after the other via a single output. It's like as if it was telling us the individual values in succession. In data transmission theory, you'd call this serial communication. Of course, our sequencer still needs to know how fast it should step through the sequence. For that, we normally use something called a clock signal. A clock signal is really just a square wave oscillation going on and off at a steady pace. Our sequencer would then proceed to the next step every time that clock signal goes from off to on, also called low to high. And so the frequency of our clock signal determines the speed of our output sequence, that is, how fast it switches from step to step. After passing the last step, the sequencer would traditionally start over with the first value in the sequence, giving us an infinite five-step loop. In our case, we'd get an output of 0 volts, 1 volt, 2 volts, 3 volts, 4 volts, over and over. So that's CV sequences. Gate sequences, on the other hand, are a bit simpler. A gate, if you don't know, is really just a voltage going from low to high and back low again. It's essentially a digital signal. To program a gate sequencer, you'd simply tell it whether you want a gate on a specific step or not. It will then go through these instructions, again advancing one step at a time, in sync with our clock signal. Every time it encounters a gate on, it will send out a voltage pulse, resulting in a gate sequence that looks something like this. It's basically just a voltage that's pulsing rhythmically. In a typical patch, you would use this to drive an envelope generator, which in turn would drive a VCA and or a filter, allowing you to add rhythm and dynamics to your melodies. Now, ideally, you'd want your sequencer to be able to send out both types of sequences at once, so that it's able to provide both melody and rhythm simultaneously. And even though that might sound somewhat complex, it's actually reasonably easy to achieve. To do it, we'll use an old favorite from the synth DIY scene, the CD4017. It's a simple decade counter chip, which means that it's able to count from 1 to 10. For this, it has 10 count state outputs and a clock input. Here's how it works. When we fire the chip up, the first count state output will be on, meaning that it sends out a high level voltage, while all the others will be off meaning that they're sitting at ground level. This tells us that the current count is 1. Now, whenever the signal we apply to the clock input goes from low to high, the currently active count state output will turn off, and the next one will turn on, meaning that the count has increased by 1. So the chip is basically just turning on its count state outputs one by one in sync with the clock signal. For this to work, there's one additional input we need to pay attention to, though, called the clock inhibit pin. Fortunately, all we have to do is tie it to ground permanently, 
This is necessary because the chip will only listen for a clock signal if this pin is sitting at a low level voltage. If we give it a high level voltage, it will tell the chip to ignore anything coming in through the clock input. Speaking of the clock input, you might ask what the diode and resistor are doing here. Didn't we say that the chip is simply expecting a signal that goes on and off in regular intervals? If that's true, why can't we just feed it a square wave oscillation from an oscillator? Simple, because oscillators usually send out a signal that is centered around the zero volts line, meaning that it swings between a positive and a negative voltage. The problem with this is that most, if not all chips, really don't like to receive any voltage levels that are outside of the ones we supply them with. In our case, we're powering our CD4017 with plus 12 and zero volts. So applying any voltage greater than 12 or lower than zero volts to the chip's clock input is a really bad idea. In the worst case, it could even kill our chip completely, which means we'll need to protect it from those out of scope voltage levels. Thankfully, we don't really have to worry about voltages higher than 12 volts, because that's the maximum voltage level in a typical Eurorack system. So we'll only shield our chip from negative voltages. To do that, we just need a bog standard diode. Diodes are basically like one-way streets for electricity. They allow for current to flow in only one direction, which is indicated by the arrow in the diode symbol. If we set up the diode so that the arrow is pointing towards our clock input, only positive voltages will be allowed to pass through. Negative voltages, on the other hand, will try to suck current out of the chip, which the diode will block. Great, but then why the additional 100k resistor here? Because without it, while the diode is blocking, the clock input pin would be floating, meaning that there'd be no defined voltage applied to it. This is a problem because floating inputs are prone to picking up noise and radio waves, which would cause the chip to behave in weird and unexpected ways. To avoid this, we use a pull-down resistor, which is just a decently big resistor going to ground after our diode. Here's how that works. Whenever the voltage coming from our clock signal is high, a small current is flowing through the diode and resistor and to ground. This is why the resistor should be relatively big, because we don't want to waste a lot of current here. When the clock signal then swings low, the diode will block. But because the resistor is connecting the clock input to ground, it will be pulled down to ground level. It's like as if the resistor was setting a default voltage that gets overridden whenever the diode conducts. So with this setup, we effectively chop off any part of our clock signal that might dip below the zero volts line, which should keep our chip safe and happy. To try all this on a breadboard, we'll need to make the chip's internal state visible somehow. For this, we'll simply use a bunch of LEDs attached to the count state outputs through current limiting resistors. These are necessary because LEDs are super quick to burn out if we push too much current through them. Now, you might ask why we're setting up only 5 LEDs when the chip has 10 outputs in total. Well, there's actually nothing stopping us from using all 10. I simply made the decision to build a sequencer with 5 steps exactly, so I'm only interested in the first 5 outputs. Assuming you're willing to go along with this, let's set up the circuit on a breadboard. First, we'll slot in the chip over here. To make it work at all, we'll then connect it to power and ground. Next, tie the clock inhibit pin to ground, along with the reset pin, just to keep it from floating. We'll talk about it in detail in a second. Now, we'll connect the clock input to a jack socket through a diode. Slot in a 100k resistor between the clock input and ground, and we can move on to the LEDs. Here, I'll first add in all five current limiting resistors. Slot in the 5 LEDs, and we're done. To test this, I'll use a reasonably slow LFO as our clock signal. As you can see, all LEDs go dark for an extended period of time as the count state increases past 5. This is not really what we're looking for, 
As I said earlier, we'd expect a standard sequencer to loop back to the first step after it passes the last one. So how do we achieve this with our chip? Simple, by using the chip's reset functionality. It works like this. Whenever we apply a high level voltage to the reset pin, the chip will clear its internal count state, setting the count to one and making the first step LED light up, no matter where we were before. If we want our counter to loop around after step five, we simply connect step six to the reset pin. Why step six and not step five? Because the reset input is triggered the instant it detects a high level voltage. So by connecting step six to the reset pin, we jump back to the first step as soon as we try to move past step five. Testing this is as easy as connecting step six and the reset pin with a jumper. As you can see, our chip is now trapped in an endless five step loop, just as we want it. Of course, there's nothing keeping us from shortening the loop to our heart's content. Here's four steps, three steps, and two steps. Doing this with a jumper is of course not the most user-friendly method though. So for an actual module build, you'd probably want to use a switch. With a regular single pole double throw switch, we can connect one point in a circuit to one of two others, depending on the switch's position. It's the equivalent of keeping our jumper plugged into one spot while moving the other end between two fixed points. This would allow us to connect our reset pin to two different steps, giving us the choice between two different loop lengths. Since I'd like to be a bit more flexible with my options though, I'd go for a single pole triple throw switch instead. It's the same basic concept, but with three instead of just two signal destinations, allowing us to choose between three distinct loop lengths, five steps, four steps, and three steps. But as cool as watching our chip light up these LEDs is, it's still not sending out any type of sequence. So let's change that. We'll start with implementing a control voltage output. Right now, our individual steps are either sending out zero volts when they're off or 12 volts when they're on. And while we can't do much with zero volts, we can do a lot with 12 volts. Because if we take those 12 volts and route them through a potentiometer set up as a variable voltage divider, we can scale them down to any voltage between 12 and zero volts. If you don't know how voltage dividers work, I've put a link to a thorough explanation in the description. But the basic gist is this. By taking two resistances, connecting them in series, tying one end to a voltage and the other to ground, we can pick up a fraction of that voltage where they meet. The relation between them will determine what fraction we get. Now conveniently, a potentiometer is really just this setup shoved into a single component, which allows us to change the resistance relation by turning a knob. Which is why it can be set up as a variable voltage divider. So let's say we add in such variable voltage dividers after every one of our five step outputs. Then by turning the potentiometer's knobs, we can set a specific output voltage between zero and 12 volts for each step. Cool. The only problem is that now we've got five individual outputs, one for each step. That's not really what we were looking for. We wanted a single output that gives us each step's voltage in succession. Now you might be tempted to simply connect all these individual outputs together. After all, the chip's steps only send out a voltage when they're active, right? And since no two steps are active simultaneously, we should only see the currently active steps voltage at our spliced together output. Unfortunately, this idea ignores the fact that these five outputs can't just source current, they can also sync it. Which means that when one of the outputs is active, current from that output would flow back into the other four. This is not only shoddy engineering, it would also mean that the output voltage is much lower than expected. So how do we fix that? Easy, with a bunch of diodes. As we've discussed earlier, diodes only let current pass through in one direction. 
So if we place one after every individual step output and then connect all the diodes together, the problem should be fixed. Because now no current can flow back into the outputs, since the diodes are blocking that. Great. There's just one small thing we need to do before we can give this a try. And that is buffering the output voltage. Because without doing that, the current coming from our chip has to squeeze through these potentiometers before it reaches the output. This means that if the module we're driving with our output is even a bit power hungry, it will make the output voltage drop noticeably. This is not ideal. We want the output voltage to be the same in any and all situations. To ensure that, we use an op-amp based buffer. Buffers are great in situations like these because they allow us to make copies of voltages without pulling any current. So by placing a buffer between our diodes and the output socket, we can make sure the module we drive with it can pull plenty of current without the output voltage dropping. As a final touch, we'll put a 1K resistor after the buffer's output. This is just to limit the maximum amount of current flowing out of or into the op-amp in case of a short circuit. Great, so let's finally test this in practice. I'll pull out our five LEDs for now. Next, I'll set up the five potentiometers, connect one end on each to ground and the other to our step outputs. Then I'll use five diodes to connect the potentiometer's wipers together. For the op-amp buffer, I'll set up a TL074, which is four op-amps in a single chip. Connect the diodes to the buffer's input, put a 1K resistor between its output and a jack socket, and we're done. Let's see if this works. I'll clock our circuit with my sequencer while connecting the CV output to my VCO's CV input. Now, if I play with the potentiometers, we should be able to get a melody going. Cool, though it's unfortunately pretty difficult to dial in the exact notes I want. This is because the CV range per step is just way too big. It's going from 0 all the way to 12 volts. Thankfully, adjusting this is pretty easy. All we have to do is scale our CV down using a standard fixed voltage divider. If we want our CV to stay within a range of 0 to 5 volts, for example, we'll have to choose two resistors that will give us a divide down factor of about 2.4. Simply because 12 volts divided by 2.4 gives us 5 volts. Unfortunately, that ratio is hard to hit exactly. Partly because of component tolerances, partly because finding the right value resistors can be tricky. So we'll have to give ourselves some wiggle room by including a small value trimmer potentiometer in our voltage divider. And even though we now technically have three resistors in our voltage divider, we can simply act as if the trimmer and the 51K resistor form one single bigger resistor. So by turning the trimmer's knob, we can fine tune the voltage divider's ratio. To test this, I'll set up our trimmable voltage divider between the five diodes and the output buffer. Now, to make sure that our sequencer's maximum CV level is exactly 5 volts, I've simply connected my multimeter to the CV output, while setting all potentiometers to maximum blast. As you can see, we're currently pretty far off from our goal. So I'll fiddle with the trimmer until we hit those 5 volts. This is looking good. Let's see how this plays out when we connect it to the oscillator again. As you can hear, it's now much easier to set up a nice sounding sequence. Of course, you could reduce the range even more if you want. All you'd have to do is adjust the voltage divider's ratio. Now, before we move on to the gate output, I'd like to take a short detour and add our LEDs back in, 
simply because that would make it much easier to know which step is currently active. You might be tempted to simply drive them the same way as we did before, but that would actually be a bad long-term decision. Because while the 4017 is able to provide enough current for a single LED, this already pushes it to its absolute limits. Which means that if we have it drive LEDs for an extended period of time, we're risking damage or even component failure. So we'll have to find a way to offload it. For that, we can use an NPN transistor. If we set it up like this, a very small current coming from the chip will be enough to drive the LED at full throttle. Here's how it works. As long as the chip's output is sitting at zero volts, no current will flow on this path, which means that the transistor is blocking any current from flowing between its collector and emitter. So our LED will be turned off as well. But as soon as the output goes high, a very small current is squeezed through the 100K resistor and into the transistor's base. This is enough to make the transistor open up wide, allowing for lots of current to flow between collector and emitter. That current might actually be strong enough to wreck our LED. So to be safe, we'll put a 1K resistor between the LED and our power rail. Now, whenever the output is high, our LED will safely light up without stressing the chip at all. To test this, I'll first bring the five LEDs back in and connect them to the power rail through 1K resistors. Then I'll put five generic NPN transistors between the LEDs and ground. Finally, send our five step outputs into the transistor's bases through 100K resistors and we're ready to give this a try. And yeah, it works. So let's move on to the gate output. Since we said earlier that a gate is really just a voltage going from low to high and back low again, you might assume that our chip is already providing gates for us. After all, it simply turns its outputs on and off in succession. So we're essentially getting a gate per step, right? If that were true, we could apply what we've learned from the CV output and set up something like this. Each step gets routed through its own switch, followed by a diode. Then we'd simply connect them all together and buffer the resulting voltage with another op-amp. Now by turning these switches on or off, we should be able to decide if we want to get a gate on a specific step or not. To make sure our buffer's input isn't left floating when a step's gate is turned off, we also need to add in a 100k pull-down resistor here. Finally, we'll again place a 1K resistor as short circuit protection between our buffer and the output socket. To see if that actually works, let's try to set it up. Because I don't have any switches that can be plugged into a breadboard, we'll simply add or remove the diode after each step to turn the gate on or off. We'll then buffer the point where the diodes meet with another op-amp, while putting in a 100K pull-down resistor. Add in the 1K and output socket and we can give this a try. For that, I've connected the gate output to an envelope, which we'll use to control a low-pass filter. Right now, all gates are active, so if everything works as expected, we should hear the filter's cutoff point move on every step as the envelope is triggered. Unfortunately, this doesn't seem to work. The envelope doesn't get triggered at all, and so the filter isn't opening up. What's going on here? Take a close look at our step indicator LEDs. You can see that one of them is lit up at all times. There's never a moment where all LEDs go dark. Since we are combining all of the steps together for our gate output, that gate output will be stuck at a high level voltage permanently. Simply because if one of the step outputs is high, the gate output will be high as well. This is why our envelope isn't triggered. The gate output would have to momentarily go low for that. Bummer, so how can we fix this? Take a look at these two graphs. The one up top is what we're currently getting out of our gate output. The one below shows us what a proper gate sequence with all gates active should look like. Because a gate, as we said in the beginning, is a voltage going from low to high and back low again. So how do we convert our output signal into a proper sequence of gates? This is where it gets a bit tricky. We basically have to make sure that our output always goes low before we reach the next step. 
thankfully, we've got something that can help us out with this. That something is the clock signal. Because if we overlay our current output and that clock signal, we see something interesting. Where the output stays high during each entire step, the clock actually goes low for the second half. So if we were somehow able to pull the output low whenever the clock is low, our problem would be solved. And though this might sound complicated, it's actually quite easy to implement. All we need are three components, an op amp, a 100k resistor and a diode. Here's how it works. Whenever the clock input is low, the buffer's output will also be low. This will allow for current to flow through the diode and into the buffer. Now, without the 100k resistor here, this would basically result in a short circuit and burning chips. But with it, we'll simply see the voltage here drop close to ground level, as the buffer is comfortably eating up what's squeezed through the resistor. This is why we need the buffer, by the way to ensure that we can sync all the current coming through the diode. On the other hand, whenever the clock signal is high, the buffer's output will also be high. This means that the diode will now be pushed shut from below. Because of this, current is blocked from flowing on this path, leaving whatever voltage we currently have at this point undisturbed. So no matter if that voltage is high or low, it will stay that way whenever the clock is high. Great. So let's set this up on the breadboard and see how we fare. First, I'll buffer the clock signal with another op amp. Then I'll put a 100k resistor between our five diodes and the gate output buffer. Finally, connect that buffer's input to the clock buffer's output through a diode. That's it. Let's give this a spin. And yeah, this actually works. Our envelope gets triggered on each step, moving the filter's cutoff point. And so we can finally hear our sequence playing. Great. There is one small thing that you might be concerned about if you're really observant. When we added in this extra 100k resistor, we only wanted to prevent creating a short circuit on this path. Unfortunately, this has an unintended side effect. Together with our pull-down resistor, the new current limiting resistor forms a voltage divider. This means that even if the clock input is high and the pull-down diode is blocked, the voltage at the gate buffer's input will be cut down. By 50% to be precise. So instead of the full 12 volts coming from our counter chip, we'll only get around 6 volts at the gate buffer's output. Now apparently, this is still a strong enough signal to trigger our envelope. But different envelopes have different gate signal requirements. Some might only trigger at 8 or even 10 volts. So in order to make our sequencer compatible with any envelope, we should try and boost its gate output up to 12 volts. To do that, we'll first turn our gate output buffer into a comparator. Comparators, if you don't know, simply compare an input voltage to a reference voltage. When the input voltage is above that threshold, the comparator's output will jump to the positive supply voltage. Conversely, when the input is below the threshold, the output will jump to the negative supply voltage. In our setup here, I've set the comparator's threshold to about 3.8 volts with a 100k, 47k voltage divider. The exact value is actually not that important here as long as it's significantly above zero and below six volts. Because as we know, the voltage at the comparator's input will be swinging between slightly above zero and around six volts. So the threshold needs to be somewhere in the middle between those two values. Then the comparator will push out super beefy gates jumping between plus and minus 12 volts. Unfortunately, that's overshooting the mark considerably. We said we wanted 12 volt gates, not 24 volt gates. To fix this, we use a trick that should be very familiar by now. Routing our signal through a diode, followed by a pull down resistor. This will cut off our gates lower halves, making them swing between just plus 12 and 0 volts. <laughs> 
Then we'll buffer the result with another op amp to ensure that the gate output can source and sync plenty of current, followed by the standard short circuit preventing 1K resistor between the buffer's output and the output socket. Let's set up this final adjustment on the breadboard. First, we'll turn our buffer into a comparator by connecting its inverting input to a 100K, 47K voltage divider between 12 volts and ground. Then, we'll connect the comparator's output to the fourth and final op amp in our TL074 through a diode. Add in the 100K pulldown resistor and configure the op amp as a buffer, connect its output to an output socket through a 1K resistor, and we're ready to give this a final spin. As you can hear, the result is identical to what we've had before. But we can rest easy knowing that it will work with pretty much any envelope now. Cool, but there's one thing we haven't tested yet. Deactivating some of the step's gates. Let's try it by removing the diodes for gates 3 and 5. And yeah, that works as well. Great. So there you have it. A really simple 5-step sequencer with both a CV and gate output. In a future video, we'll talk about ways of quantizing the CV output to simplify the process of dialing in harmonic sequences. But for now, this is all I have. In the meantime, be sure to check out my Patreon. You can support the channel there while also gaining access to a bunch of bonus content. Anyways, thanks for watching and until next time. See ya!